Hello everyone, thanks for joining this uh, next session of the P7 user conference. Uh, we have uh, on stage uh, Mr. Johannes Geritsen from uh, um, the uh, Technical University of, uh, of, of Dresden. Uh, and um, Nina uh, Muello uh, uh, from, from that advance. Um, and um, uh, both will present a, a paper for efficient optimization of material properties based on experimental data. Um, so with this, I'd like to, uh, to give you the floor, uh, Johannes and, and Nina. Before that, uh, just a quick reminder, if you want to ask any question uh, to our speakers for this session, uh, please use the Q&A tab uh, in Accel event uh, page. And this is where you can, uh, we can post all the questions. Um, so with this, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so yeah, as Laurent said, so we worked a lot uh, over the past month on the efficient optimization of material properties and we're solely focused on experimental data here. And in order to give you a brief overview, so first I would like to start with presenting our company, so the TIA Dresden and the Institute of Lightweight Engineering and Polymer Technology, and give a very brief introduction to the overall optimization problem. And Nina will then take over and explain a bit more in detail about the approach that that advance um, yeah, propose, what the methodology they employed and give a few conclusions and the perspective. So for the TU Dresden, we are one of the largest universities in Eastern Germany. And actually we are one out of just 10 universities all over Germany that have achieved this status of excellence um, in 2012. At our university, there's a very wide range of topics uh, that is being covered so from social studies, engineering, up to like pure science. And in all of those areas, we're doing both research as well as educating young students. And especially in the education part, there's always been a very strong focus on the engineering side, where currently there are about 50% of our students that are in engineering. And we as an Institute of Lightweight Engineering and Polymer Technology, we are part of this um, engineering faculty. So on this slide here, you can see a couple of key figures for our institute. I think what is most important here is that we've always been focused on increasing the efficiency of components of systems. And historically, this has oftentimes been done by reducing the weight of such components. But recently, there's been a lot of um, research going on um, into expanding these uh, system boundaries and, for example, analyzing the CO2 cost of high performance materials and then weighing whether the usage of such um, components or materials will actually have a net positive impact on the carbon cost of a part over its entire lifetime. And all this research is spread out roughly equally over three areas from fundamental research over application oriented to industry development. And the project that we're talking about today is driven by the industry where a partner of ours is developing a novel jet turbine with a significantly increased bypass ratio. And this uh, novel type of turbine, this uh, comes along with significantly increased requirements on the materials. And the currently available materials uh, meeting all the requirements are very limited and if so, very expensive. So in our research project, we are concerned with developing a novel type of material that will meet all of the requirements. And as you can imagine, uh, running experiments on new materials is always extremely expensive. In uh, the beginning or upfront, it is unclear how input parameters will actually influence the outcome. And you do not have a sufficient understanding of the entire system to run simulation in order to create data that you can actually rely on. 
And with this problem, we approached uh, that advance where we had an experimental database in which uh, the inputs had been varied. So here, especially the chemical composition of the material, as well as a lot of the processing parameters. And we wanted to guide the future experiments uh, towards meeting our project goals, which here is specifically increasing the specific Young's modulus. So basically uh, the stiffness per weight while at the same time meeting all of the criteria on the mechanical side. And Nina will now talk to you a bit more in detail about how we went together to try and achieve this. Thank you, Johannes. I will take over with the share of the screen, I think. All right. All right. Okay, so thank you for this uh, introduction, Johannes. Uh, I will now switch with the problem more on the P7 side. So like we said, our goal was to run an optimization of those material properties based on uh, 10 inputs and two objective with three constraints. So then uh, our main question was how to extract this uh, optimal material properties, so the optimal point. But we went through some limitations due to the high dimensionality of the input domain, which is 10. And this uh, multi-objective optimizations, we had to remember two objectives, while at the same time having a very reduced budget because we want to target like at the first step this uh, optimal design. Uh, we had also limited behavioral information because the uh, accessible information was a database of only 35 points uh, with sometimes incomplete information. So it's very uh, limited. To give you an idea, the ideal number of points is uh, for an optimization is evaluated at around 10 times the number of uh, input variables. So in our case, it would mean uh, 100 points to get something quite relevant. Uh, and another uh, limit limitation, sorry, was that we didn't have any access to any simulation tool to run as a black box in the loop on an iterative pro process in order to get this uh, input-output relationship more easily. So because of that, we only had uh, experimental approach and data uh, to get some information. But at the same time, it requires, like Johannes said, a lot of tests, uh, which is very expensive in terms of money and time. So uh, there comes P7. The proposed approach was to go through uh, two steps. The first one was to uh, extract from the information we had, most information as possible. So uh, the problem was we had this kind of uh, database like that with some points that were uh, complete, but some others that were not. So the, the first step was to actually populate this database in order to have uh, a prediction on those uh, values here in the C2 cell and in the P4, for example. To do so, we used the approximation model capabilities of P7 to build some prediction models and to make some predictions about those missing points. And on the second step, we used this uh, populated database to perform optimization and to get this uh, optimal point from the optimization problem. Uh, this optimization part relies also on the surrogate-based optimization, which we call SBO. So in the end, with those two steps, we had two workflows to automate the process. Going for the first step, uh, with the first database coming from uh, actual measurements, so experimental values, we had 10 points uh, where we had all the output values information. So the two objectives and three constraint values. Whereas uh, a second database was given from uh, simulation, like previous simulation and um, yeah, previous knowledge of this uh, material, 
with uh, 25 points, but from those points, we only had access to the Young's modulus uh, values. So we had to guess or to predict the other outputs of the models, okay? Based on the first database, so those 10 points, we were able to build approximation models and then uh, use these approximation models to get uh, an estimation of the density, elongation, UTS, and yield strength of the remaining 25 points. With that, uh, we, so yes, we then use those models to predict the missing outputs. And with that, we had a full database with all the information of 35 points, which is not a big database, but still we wanted to use as much information as possible. Uh, to do that more practically, we were using this uh, workflow. So I just decided to split it into three steps. The first one is to load the databases from CSV. So using the CSV parser block, we we're able to access each part of the databases, both from experimental and simulation. So the database with 10 points and with uh, 25 points. Using all those information combined for the specific um, parts, we created for each missing output a model. Okay, so here you have the first model for max elongation, for UTS, yield strength, and density. And inside those composite blocks, you have a sub workflows uh, to create the model and build the prediction. In the end, every information is combined into one single CSV file. Uh, to give you an idea, so inside all of those blocks, you have this kind of workflow with the first block to create a model. Okay, using the smart selection algorithm, we are able to uh, leave P7, decide which technique is the most appropriated for the creation of this model. Okay, so uh, for each uh, output value, we can have a different model at each time. It's, it's not a problem. What we just want is an accurate estimation. And this second block here will predict the missing values from the uh, simulation database. Uh, this first step is, like you saw, uh, an automated process to create the models and evaluate the missing values. So you just have to actually press play at the beginning of the workflow and it will treat the existing values, build a model, build the prediction and uh, send you back with a full CSV with all the values. Uh, it can be easily launched to populate again a database after an update. So imagine that Johannes has access to a new experiment, a new data. Uh, he just has to add this experiment to already existing CSV files, launch again the workflow, and uh, everything will be updated. So because he will have more information, the um, error and the accuracy estimation of the model is expected to be uh, better, to be improved. Uh, again, the smart selection algorithms allow to fine tune the model building to create performance approximations without the improvement of an expert. P7 is uh, in charge of this, uh, let's say, building of performance models. Uh, and all the models are independent. And what is very convenient with P7 is this automatically generated report. So you have some pictures here where you have some very basic metrics uh, immediately available. Like you see R square, root mean square, some quantiles and median values. And you have also some plots um, summarizing the error quantiles, for example, here. So you have a fraction of points as a function of the absolute error. And the goal indeed is to have a curve that goes as much as possible straight like this to the top left point, which would mean that you have an error of zero for a fraction of points, which is one. So it means all your points have no error with respect to the model. So you have some tools like that to evaluate your model and uh, check its accuracy. Then once your models are, have been created and you have this fully populated database, the user can switch to a second workflow. So once the database is complete, it is used in this optimization workflow using a design space exploration block. So we call it DSE. 
uh, this DSC block will manage the uh, optimization task, taking as information the full input database with those uh, 35 points with all the input output information. Then we had to tune a bit this design space explorer. So like for the models, we have the smart selection algorithm, which allows, uh, uh, let's say, yeah, this technique selection of um, the most appropriate technique depending on the definition of your problem. Uh, so we see here all the variables that were defined and the responses with two objectives in minimizing the density and maximizing the Young's modulus. We also had some constraints. Okay, so depending on how the user defines everything, here P7 decided to select a surrogate based optimization technique. Um, we also had to tune the exploration budget to one uh, because we just relied on existing data sets. So our goal was to uh, produce only one point that would be the best uh, estimation. So one target here for P7. Uh, also, there is no iterative process, like we said, uh, P7 is not connected to a simulation tool to give some feedback. So, um, yeah, one shots here for this task. And finally, we had to set the global search intensity to zero. It is also linked to the budget. It means that um, in this kind of technique, surrogate based optimization, P7 has uh, no budget allowed to explore the design space it really will target optimization uh, straight to the, from the first point. Um, so in the end, as a conclusion, we had uh, those two workflows are building an automated approach to build first models and populate database when needed, and then to um, perform this optimization. The entire process takes around two minutes, which is very fast. Uh, and brings a lot of knowledge into uh, what can be expected and extracted from the existing databases. Um, it's important that uh, before optimization, a first check of the models and prediction is possible through those reports. So the user has access to some information about the prediction and how accurate uh, they are. The optimizer is also parameterized to give the optimal points at the first computation. Uh, relying on a dedicated surrogate model inside the optimizer. And so in the end, even with low data, uh, like I said, we have here a third of what is expected for uh, such optimization. The models are able to give a tendency. So it's not something we uh, will take as like the real optimal point, but at least it will give an idea of where to, what to try for the next experiment and what are the expected results. Uh, in the end, we had this workflows for a reduced complexity and time compared to uh, only experimental testing. Um, also some information, um, both initial databases were uh, very small. And even if they are from different uh, sources, we decided to gather them into one single database because of this low amount of data. If we had more data, P7 also has another approach, which is called data fusion, which enables to give some weight to what is the high fidelity and low fidelity data. So it's also something we are thinking of with Johannes. Um, thank you for listening and uh, we are open to any question. All right, thank you, Nina and Johannes, for this uh, clear presentation. Very interesting. Uh, we have maybe one minute to take one question. So I have one question here. Uh, it seems that you use SBO like sample-based mode, not black box. In this case, does SBO algorithm work normally? Uh, in this case, how uh, SBO works, it likes it will take all the information we had from this uh, database okay, that we completed. And based on this uh, database, it will build uh, one model uh, to like, try to link all the points and represent uh, the overall behavior of uh, the data. And based on that, on this model, I mean, 
uh, the objective will be to target the global minimum of the model. Uh, of course, the ideal situation for such algorithm, we have this kind of, uh, feedback loop, so it can have an iterative process with, for example, a simulation tool where the optimal point uh, chosen by the SBO algorithm will be then tested with the simulation to check if the prediction of the model was in line with the, what the simulation gives. And then you enter into a process of updating of the surrogate model for the optimizer according to the results of the simulation. So here it's a bit, um, how to say, we cut a bit the process of this algorithm, but we, because of the constraints we had, that was the only solution. All right. Thank you for your answer. So I guess we have uh, no time anymore. So this was the last presentation, but there is a final session coming right after this one, just for a wrap up the conference and maybe a last word of Laurent Sheik, uh, our VP Global Sales. So please, everyone, one last time, move on to the next session. Thank you, Nina and Johannes, again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.